Washington Journal continues. Senator Mike Crapo, Republican of Idaho, let's start with the news on the the economy, if we can, before we get to our health care debate. Right. The Associated Press is reporting this morning that the economy grew at 3.5 percent pace in the third quarter, the best showing in two years. Are we on our way to an economic recovery? You know, we're definitely on our way, although we have a big debate going on right now as to whether we have really bottomed out and are growing back or whether this growth that we are now seeing is a little bit uh, caused by the stimulus spending and some of the other things that are not going to, going to be ongoing and we might tip back into it sort of a W rather than a V in our recovery. And I'm one of those who thinks that uh, we still have some pretty difficult road to, to travel here before we get out of the problems entirely. So I, I think this is great news. I hope it holds, but we want to be very cautious. Well then, if uh, you're afraid that we could dip down into a, a W type um, uh, situation, do you support then extending the government programs that have been ongoing so far? Let's start with unemployment benefits. Uh, unemployment benefits, I do agree with the extension. Uh, and as Senator Shaheen was indicating, there's a, there's a real need and a rationale for doing that right now. Uh, I did not support the stimulus package. And uh, frankly, I did not support the bailout spending in the TARP program for the, uh, the credit crisis. And I actually believe that a lot of what we have done there has uh, been detrimental to our economy in the long run and we're starting to now get a couple of years out from some of that or at least more than a year out from some of that and, and uh, we're starting to see some of the, the penalty that's going to come in on our economy as this excess debt financing and the spending that we are doing is going to uh, generate a drag on the economy so although we are seeing some short-term stimulative effect I, I think the stimulus package really has not worked very well and I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that now we are going to have to deal with the debt that we incurred when we went down that road. This is the front page of USA Today. Stimulus helps fill coffers for the states. Federal cash offsets drops in tax revenue and has uh, allowed states to hold on to their government workers and avoid some of the layoffs and cuts um, that they would have had to otherwise make. In order to avoid that dip down again in the economy that you, you say you're, uh, you're afraid of, do you support giving more money to the states? Well, I've always supported making sure that when the federal government puts a mandate on the states, and we put plenty of mandates on the states, in fact, a lot of the spending at the state level is driven by federal policy. Uh, I've always supported the principle that the federal government should not put unfunded mandates on the states, and that to the extent we force them to spend, we should assist in that burden. Uh, that being said, uh, again, the stimulus package in the short term is helping the states, and it's helping in some specific areas. Uh, but we've got to remember this is a one-time thing, and it's pretty much spent out its positive impacts, I think, right now. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to see how we sustain that in the coming months. What about the uh, housing tax credit for first-time uh, home buyers? It's been attached to uh, the unemployment benefits extension. It's now being expanded to those uh, uh, potential buyers who, who want to buy a primary residence and haven't done so in about eight years, I believe. I think this was one of the good ideas that Congress has and has tried to work through in the past months, and uh, I strongly support its extension. In fact, I think we should have increased the level of the tax credit so that we could increase the, the, the incentive, if you will, for the purchase of homes and get that uh, inventory off the market and start helping the housing industry to stabilize. Let's go to the health care debate. A lot to talk about yes. uh, today. The, the House is expected, Democratic leaders in the House, is expe they're expected to unveil their legislation. It's supposed to include a public option that centrist Democrats have advocated. That is one that allows the HHS secretary to negotiate rates for this public option rather than having it based on Medicare. Is that something that you like? Uh, no, I don't believe that we should move to a government insurance company, a government controlled insurance company. We have clear needs in the economy right now to reform the competitive environment in health care. And we definitely need to address some of those issues. But adding a government insurance company into the mix, in my opinion, is going to make uh, more trouble, not less. And the whole debate that they're having in the House as to whether the rates charged by this government insurance company should be Medicare rates or whether they should be negotiated rates shows the point that we're going to have the federal government fixing prices for its insurance company. Clearly the, the government insurance company will be subsidized by the taxpayer and ultimately what that's going to do 
is to, to create intense pressures on the private sector, which will drive up cost or ultimately result in rationing of health care. And I, I just believe that, that uh, although we do need to re reduce and control the cost of health care, uh, putting the federal government in charge of that much of the economy is not the right approach. What's your solution? Well, there are a number of things that we need to do. For in the insurance arena, which we've been talking about, we need to increase the pools of those who are available for insurance coverage. Uh, we can do that by allowing uh, people to shop across state lines for insurance. We can do that. One of the huge things that we can do that would make a big difference is to allow small businesses to pool together and get larger employee pools as they negotiate for insurance rates for their employees. We can do a number of things to change the incentives for compensation away from procedures and, to in, and into quality and outcomes in medicine so we reduce the cost there. And uh, there are a number of other things that we can do, but the point is we need to focus on what's wrong with the competitive environment and what can we do to change that? And those are the kinds of solutions we need. Annie is joining us on the independent line from Idaho Falls. Go ahead. Uh, yes, regarding selling insurance across state lines, which I actually favor, but I'm wondering if you recognize that that in itself is a federal takeover of a formerly state-regulated function. Um, absolutely. I, when, when you say it that way, I would actually describe it a little differently, but th the point there is exactly that we would allow or stop states from prohibiting people from shopping across state lines for insurance. In other words, allow people the freedom to shop outside their own state. And uh, that does take a little bit of the control away from states, and so I acknowledge that. Next phone call comes from Jesse in uh, Missouri on the Democrats' line. Morning, Jesse. Morning. Go ahead, sir. You're on the air. Oh, I'm on the air? You are. Oh. Good morning. What's Good your... Morning. Oh, you're from Michigan. Go ahead, Jesse. Oh, no, I know I'm wrong. Yes. Uh, uh, let, me, let me turn my... Let me see my TV dial. Uh, all right, Jesse, why don't I... Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay, Jesse, why don't I put you on hold? You'll, you'll get your thoughts together here. Let me ask the, the senator about uh, health care legislation. Where do you see an uh, area for compromise? Well, I think, frankly, there is a tremendous area for compromise. And if you think about it, what most Americans want in health care reform is to control the skyrocketing increases in cost for insurance and medical care. And in that arena, a number of the studies that we've worked with, both the Republicans and the Democrats, indicate that there's up to 20 percent, some studies even say closer to 30 percent savings that we can achieve by doing some of the things that will help us to address what's driving the cost drivers in the system. That's where I think we ought to be focusing and where I think we can find some of those kinds of reforms. I've already mentioned a couple of those, but one in terms of just the things that drive cost is again to create the incentives for compensation in our system that will, instead of encouraging more and more procedures, uh, instead encourage uh, people and physicians and Medicare or medical providers to provide the kinds of, of uh, services that will result in good outcomes and get the compensation focused on outcome rather than on procedures. Those kinds of things can generate significant savings. And, and like I say, there's a number of other lists of items on the list that we could address where I really believe we could find broad bipartisan support. Jesse, are you with us now? Yes, I am. Ready to go? Yes, I am. All right. All right. I'd like to ask, to ask the senator, uh, how do you expect to, uh, to uh, keep costs under control without a public option. And, and uh, it's, just, it's amazing to me how you politicians can sit up there and, and support these insurance companies that are ripping people off. That goes from auto insurance, home insurance, and all you guys are talking about is uh, you don't want no public uh, uh, option. And, uh, all right, Jesse, we'll get a response from the senator. No, thank you. You know, Jesse has just indicated an interesting dynamic because I think there are very few Americans who, who don't have some problem with an insurance company that they've had over the years, whether it was adequate coverage or, or whether they felt their claims were treated properly. And, and there's not a really good mood out there with regard to insurance companies. And one of the notions is, well, let's have the federal government create an insurance company, and that insurance company will be fair. And that insurance company will be able to do the kind of things that won't happen in the private sector. And uh, I, I'm frankly, first of all, uh, having a, I have a hard time 
believing that a government-run insurance company will be any more efficient or effective or fair than a private sector insurance company. Uh, but, and I think you only have to look at some of the government-run programs to, to see that. If you look at Medicaid, for example, which is a government-managed insurance, or not insurance, but health care delivery system. Uh, we just learned yesterday day that the fraud and, and abuse rates in uh, Medicare, Medicaid were somewhere between 1 and 10 percent, 3 and 10 percent, uh, which is way higher than the, those same levels that you have in the private sector insurance companies. Uh, and so I don't agree that the government can run this kind of a system better. Uh, one of the questions, though, is, well, but we still have this concern that in the private sector we have problems with the, a competitive environment. Certain insurance companies dominate the markets in a number of our states, and that's true. And again, what I say is we need to increase competition and increase competition by expanding pools and allowing people to get more engaged in the negotiation of insurance products like allowing small businesses to pool and allowing individuals to shop across state lines and doing other things that will create the kind of market environment where we have a much broader and more robust competitive environment. All right. We want to continue taking your phone calls this morning. Let me give you the phone lines. Republicans 202-737-0001. Democrats 202-737-0002 and Independents 202-628-0205. We're talking about the health care as well as the economy as we're getting uh, breaking news this morning about the gross domestic product increasing and uh, that the jobless claims have gone down as well. We're talking with Senator Mike Crapo, a Republican of Idaho. He sits on the Banking Committee, the Finance Committee, Budget Committee as well. Environment and Public Works and Indian Affairs Committee. So you can call in with your, your questions. If I could just go back to sure. um, the economy and uh, what we've seen. Many people are, you, you said you voted against the, the stimulus legislation, yes. but the, the president is getting credit for uh, stopping what, what some had said could be a, another Great Depression with this stimulus money. Do you give the, the administration credit for at least stopping the, the hemorrhaging that they were seeing? Well, uh, yes, to an extent. Uh, and like I said, the stimulus package, remember that was $800 billion, which was totally unpaid for, which what we mean here in Washington when we say that is directly put on the back of the debt of our children and grandchildren. I think most economists acknowledged that at the outset, in the first year or so, that kind of immense spending will have an ability to lift the economy a little bit and, and help avoid some of the, the downturn that the, co the economy was facing. And I acknowledge that. Uh, but I also think that most economists said correctly that if you get much further out than a couple of years, that $800 billion of debt will actually reduce the GDP. And in fact, I think the Congressional Budget Office indicated that same analysis, that the, the, the long-term effect of that spending, long-term meaning out just a couple of years and beyond, would be uh, such a, an increase in drag on the economy that it would reduce our GDP. So if your question is, do I acknowledge that the stimulus package had an initial short-term positive impact? Yes, though not nearly what it could have it had, if it had been designed better. But uh, long-term, $800 billion of debt is something that we just cannot continue to keep engaging in as our economy moves forward. You said you agree with uh, part of that stimulus effort that is extending unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. The Senate is uh, expected to vote uh, possibly as early as today on extending unemployment benefits even more. Do you agree with some of your Republican colleagues who are holding up this legislation over other issues like an E-Verify amendment? Should it be held up? Uh, well, first of all, it wouldn't have to be held up if we could just work out the opportunity to vote on these amendments. And, and I believe uh, not that particular, excuse me, not that particular amendment necessarily, but several of the others that it was being held for. For example, the tax credit, the home tax credit, which we now understand we might have an opportunity to include with it, and uh, the the uh, net operating loss um, look back legislation that would help stimulate the economy. Those were important provisions that should have been included along with the unemployment insurance. And yes, I believe we should have included them and hopefully will include them as we move forward. And, and those who say, well, the Republicans were holding it back for other amendments, um, the Republicans were saying we need to put more on here and do more in, in terms of helping our economy and addressing the housing crisis. Yes, I, I don't think that that was uh, 
unnecessary. West Palm Beach, Florida. Haywood, Republican line. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Um, I was thinking about, I'm a Republican, but I'm thinking about dropping them because what's happening, it looks like they are just saying no to everything. They had the office for all these years when Bush was in, and they didn't do nothing. They didn't try to do nothing. They're, now, I'm talking for the people that's making like $10 an hour here, and, and, and they can't afford their insurance. And now you telling me that you don't want government-run insurance, but yet they have Medicare and Medicaid and all that kind of stuff, and it's running pretty good. Uh, I don't understand the Republicans. Why do they want to say no to everything that comes out with a Democrat? The Democrats had to agree with them when they was in office. All right. Senator? You know, I appreciate the question because it's actually a question that is asked often, and it's a part of the attack on the Republicans that is restated often here in Washington, D.C. Uh, but I, I just think that it's uh, an inaccurate portrayal of what is happening. Uh, it's true that the Republicans, when they held, held control of Congress, had a difficulty getting a lot of their ideas through because they were filibustered by the Democrats. Uh, it's not to say that the Republicans didn't try and succeed on a number of measures. And it's also untrue to say that those who don't support a government takeover of the insurance uh, delivery system in our country uh, believe in uh, the status quo or, or in not making any reforms. I've already discussed here today several major reforms of the competitive insurance arena that we should be addressing and which Republicans have been strongly promoting and supporting only to see them rejected by the Democrats. And so, you know, if you get into this Republicans do this and Democrats do that argument, I think each side could point to their proposals that the other side has rejected and say, well, you don't support moving forward. The reality is both sides are presenting very strong, solid ideas about how we should address health care reform, and we ought to be able to get past some of these big uh, battles over what the economy, what the management of the economy should be like and whether the, the federal government should be our health care delivery system and, uh, and get to some of the really important reforms that we do have the ability to find bipartisan support for. Meridian, Mississippi. Pam, good morning. Good morning. Um, I am for the uh, uh, government option. The reason being is that I kind of look back and, uh, and realize that people like Eric Cantor last year got maybe $2 million from the uh, health insurance industry. And the insurance company would be a big windfall if we didn't have this uh, public option in. And uh, the other thing is, is that the, the majority of all Americans want this, and it truly looks when we watch C-SPAN, CNN, and all the rest of them, that the Republican Party is a definite no party all the way down the line. They're for the big business, they're for wealth, and they're still for that trickle-down economics. It just does not work. Senator? Well, again, the, you know, I, I would just have to say that, that those who say that, that the Republicans don't want to change the system are just misunderstanding what the debate is here in Washington. Uh, there is a huge debate over whether the federal government should step in and become the health care delivery system for our nation. Uh, there is uh, not a debate about doing nothing. And, uh, and I actually believe that, that uh, when you look at the polls, I know that, that we see all kinds of polls here. Uh, Every day new polls are coming out. Uh, what I hear from uh, the polls that I read uh, does not say that a majority, a majority of the public wants the federal government to step in and run the health care delivery system. Uh, I think that the idea of ha having another competitive option out there is what is appealing to many about the, the uh, government option approach. But, you know, we have over a thousand insurance companies right now in the United States, and adding just one more isn't going to really change that mix unless that one that is added is the federal government and it has the ability to control prices, to control products, and to be subsidized by the taxpayer and to create the environment in which it can drive the other insurance companies into a less competitive model. And that's the worry that we have. A couple more phone calls here for the Senator LaGrange, Kentucky. Jeff, good morning. Yes, I'm calling about the unemployment extension. Uh, I'd like to know, now they had started talking about this extension the, my, my last check I got was $206 in the middle of September. Here it is, the end of October. They haven't done anything yet. The Republican Party just a party of no. My bills is due, and they ain't doing anything. That's what I want to know. What's taking them so long to sign, the, sign a 15-minute or 2-hour bill 
you know, for, for extended unemployment. I just couldn't explain what's taking so long because my bills are still coming without, you know, I, the people that I owe ain't going to wait, you know. Jeff, then where do you go to for help? How do you get financial assistance? Does well, the state just, help you out? Ma'am? Does the state help you out? No, no. I've just been drawing unemployment. You know, that's it. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard to get help these days. You know, that's my whole point. All right. Senator? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I, again, this uh, spin, I think, that has been put out there that the Republicans are stopping the unemployment bill is simply wrong. I think you'll see that the bill will pass this week and that it will pass with significant Republican support. It will pass with my support. Uh, the delay, if any, that has occurred has just been a couple of days delay here while we work to try to get some significant help in there for home buyers, this tax purchase credit for the purchase of homes, and to get some uh, support for businesses to help them uh, carry back their net operating losses to help them be more viable and more able to employ more people. And these are good provisions that uh, I think waiting a day while we negotiated them out was worth it. Next phone call, Seattle, Washington. Mark, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Uh, Crapo. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree that the insurance um, should be opened up over state lines. And I also agree that um, the antitrust provision should be removed for the insurance companies, make it a fair market. Um, and I also agree there should be set limits on plans as far as coverage goes. So you don't have, you know, like a Connecticut-based insurance conglomerate where all the insurance companies, you know, flood into Connecticut and say, okay, well, we're going to offer substandard insurance policies and sell these and, you know, basically kowtow people into these policies that are substandard. I think every, you know, all the insurance companies need to be regulated on some level to offer a quality product that people have a choice to buy. Um, I generally agree with most everything that this caller has said. Uh, just a couple of clarifications. Uh, with regard to the kinds of uh, regulatory impacts on insurance companies uh, that I think we need to put in place uh, to make sure the policies are the kinds of policies that, that Americans want, uh, I think we can find bi bipartisan support for that kind of thing too in areas like uh, making sure that pre-existing conditions are covered or that people don't run into lifetime limits that then cause them to lose their insurance coverage and, and things like that. And those kinds of reforms I would support in the insurance industry. Uh, one que question I had, uh, and I still have, is, is with respect to the antitrust exemptions. Uh, I believe that the reason the antitrust exemption to the extent it was given to insurance companies was put into place was to allow them to share information among each other about insurance pools so that they could make more accurate and lower cost projections for the insurance of those whom they cover. Uh, if that is the case, I think to that extent at least, we still need to, to protect that opportunity so that uh, we don't unexpectedly or uh, unintentionally uh, create a circumstance in which we can't get the, the collection, the, the adequate data together to really give the kind of analysis of the insurance pools that will help us to get better and more effective rate structures. Senator, thank you for taking calls from our viewers. Uh, come thank back you. again.